Welcome to The Music Mission, where I, Kanyoti Karamanos, along with Enrico Manis, my co-host, are on a mission to explore music. Hello and welcome to uh, today's episode of The Music Mission. Where, uh, Enrico and I are joined by Nick and Olivia. Hi. Hi. And we're going to be talking about um, classical music and audiences and inclusion and exclusion um, in terms of their participation, like the enjoyment and... Yeah. Well, it came up because last time when we were talking about Tchaikovsky, we ended up on the topic of applause and the inappropriateness or lack thereof. No, appropriateness or lack thereof, I should have said. Anyway, um, and so we all shared our views, but Olivia wasn't there that day. So, Olivia, applause between movements and at the wrong times. Is it good? Is it okay? Does it infuriate you? Um, I mean, I personally don't like it but i like the enthusiasm that comes behind it and i also like the fact that it means that people who aren't you know formally or tertiary trained musicians are also in the audience and they just like what they hear and they they clap along i mean thinking back in the past it used to be or i believe clapping between movements as they had you know different different like singers between or chamber groups in between um so i guess yeah i, I mean i personally don't clap when I'm not meant to, but it's not the biggest deal. What do you think, Nick? Well, it's a vexed issue in a whole lot of ways. I mean, obviously, the gesture of applause is a beautiful one, which is that the listeners are showing their appreciation for what they've just heard. And on a broader level, the sense of community in the performance experience, the idea that we are all in this together and we all want this performance to go well and we all want to have a good night, whether it's because you're on the first desk of the violins and you want to maintain your job there or because you're going on a date with somebody and you want to have a nice date or because you're, I don't know, just going as a regular subscription concert go or whatever it might be. And so the gesture of applause, I think, is, is, is wonderful. So as a general principle, I love applause, although... There are certainly cases when applause can be awkward or irritating for various reasons. I think one of those those moments is um, when I don't want to say an uninformed crowd, but sometimes you know you, you do have like let's say novice, um, you know fresh concert goers and who aren't. So I'm thinking of uh, Meet the Music. Remember Meet the Music in high school? I remember Meet the Music. Yeah, and uh, so kids are uh, so generally a younger audience who after a movement there's that awkward pause and you know turn pages and all that stuff uh and then there's the slow clap and i think that is uh something so y- you know what i'm talking about right people aren't quite sure like what do we do and there's this awkwardness in 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 the room and i think that comes from both the audience and the orchestra because you know it is a communal it is a communal experience and it's very much dependent on the energy um that's happening the synergy between performer and and audience and so when it comes to cl- applause between movements i think if if the audience is enraptured and they just they just love it so much that they, they just they can't help themselves and start applauding then i will love it but if it's awkward then me as a performer straight away i think to myself something's not going quite right with our performance that 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 cuz i feel like there are certain different contexts in which the audience would just instantly know that okay, this is like not the appropriate time to to applaud because they can feel the tension in the room. And if it becomes ambiguous to the audience as to what the intent is or like when they can or they can't, then I feel like something's been lost in translation. Oh, for sure, I agree with that. I mean, one of the things which music teachers will often talk about is how a student should sustain the tension in things like lengthy pauses or long notes, such that people don't think it's all over Red Rover, such that people understand that the narrative of the music is (coughs) continuing through those moments. So, in a sense, when people do clap at the wrong times, it can be seen to reflect poorly on the performer or performers, rather than necessarily the audience. But I'd, I'd really like to take all of your, your temperatures on this, because one of the things that came up in our Tchaikovsky podcast was 
the Andra Schiff concert tour, some concerts of which he played here in Australia, where he walked on stage and in his inimitable Hungarian accent asked the audience to refrain from applauding until the very last work of the program because he felt it disrupted the overall trajectory of the program more broadly, not only the individual pieces therein. And it was very interesting to see how, on the one level, that obviously brought a lot more concentration in the audience, because the thing I noticed was that things like coughing, shuffling, moving programs around, fidgeting, that sort of thing, were so much less than normal. But also, there was a kind of warmth and enjoyment in the audience, at least at the Sydney Opera House, just as judged by things like demeanours on their faces at the interval and stuff, which maybe was lacking, mm. which perhaps otherwise would not have been the case. I'd be really interested to hear how you guys feel about the idea of a concert in which the audience are told not to applaud until the very end. Yeah, that's a really interesting one because um, I guess classical music concerts are a little bit different to many other of the arts. When you see a play, you don't see usually small vignettes or five-minute pieces and then you know a, a large piece. You, you see a production, you clap at interval, you clap at the end. Mm -hmm. And whereas in a ballet, for example, every time the prima ballerina or whatever does something impressive, you clap, you show that appreciation. So it does sort of have this funny mid-ground between it does have an overall story throughout the whole thing, and yet between between certain parts, people will want to clap because they thought, I really liked that in particular. I think it's a bit of an interesting move to tell the audience explicitly what you want. I'm kind of torn. On the one hand, I totally understand it. And it does, I guess you're cur curating your own idea of how the performance should be as an artist. On the other hand, I don't know, do you reckon it's the audience's right to clap when they want? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, I remember speaking to a pianist walking out of that concert who wasn't a fan at all of what he'd asked the audience to do. And I asked her why, and she said to me, it's like when you go to, go to hug somebody and they push you away. Mm. Like, that's not a very nice gesture. And that is how she felt about that. On the other hand, it actually, in a way, elevated the music. It made it more than just an object of a little bit of light entertainment. It made it this kind of monastic almost experience, this spiritual, very serious intellectual experience. And I personally think that really worked for the repertoire he was playing. So there was a lot of Bach. There was, I think there was the Mozart A minor Rondo. I uh, late Brahms, Brahms 117, as I remember. These very serious contemplative pieces. And I wonder if with a piece like the Tchaikovsky Concerto that we were discussing in our last podcast, whether that would be as effective. I don't know what you guys think about that. I think the the big benefit of Schiff telling them beforehand is that you do at least get everyone on the same page and there is going to be a consistency of effect and consistency of atmosphere throughout the throughout that performance so whether everyone likes that monastic feeling or not it's sort of okay we're not gonna we're all here for it and i'm not surprised like you said that it did have the additional effect of removing the coughing and the shuffling because everyone was like it's it's clear that the experience is continuing between between the pieces and so it becomes more like yeah, I don't know, those examples you gave where even in a, in a play or something where it still seems semi-acceptable to clap after a particularly, I don't know, big monologue or big sort of moment. Um, or I don't know, almost more like a movie where you so, sort of sit down and then it all happens and you don't really move a muscle and then at the end you sort of, I mean, not that anyone claps in a movie, but at the end it really only ends at the end and then you sort of leave and you've had that experience or as like a whole. a church um, service or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so, yeah, and I wonder 
in it, being able to remove that awkwardness from those. I like that you said, Manny, the awkward moments between movements where you have that sort of everyone lets their instruments down and there's this page turning and sort of shuffling around. It's awkward kind of irrespective of whether you get the mistaken clap or not. And so I wonder if people clapping at the wrong time sort of being something jarring is more of a symptom of a larger problem rather than a problem in itself that we as classical musicians haven't really figured out what to do in those moments between movements and so it's just not effective regardless mm. it's really interesting the whole notion of t- instructing the audience or not instructing but telling informing them that hey we're not going to applaud between these movements there is i'm not sure if you've heard of them they're called the phoenix orchestra or something very similar to that um the phoenix symphonic orchestra and, and they're they're in america uh <laughs> very general uh but they tell their audience the opposite. They actually encourage, because as as we know, you know, classical music uh, wasn't received as w- as we do today, and that that's an interesting thing that we can probably dive into in a few uh, a bit later. Um, in that, they were kind of the pieces were written really for for a live audience that will be talking over. Like think of just Beethoven five, ba 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 ba. Oh, the audience is shocked. Or or Mozart da 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 forces the audience to say, hang on, wait, have they, have they started? Oh, they have. Shh. And so this orchestra, they're trying to recreate this by informing the audience that actually we want you to talk. Actually, we want you to be on your phone. And we're going to encourage this um, by giving you the programs, uh, giving you a QR code where you have to scan and there's your program. And we want you to take Instagram stories and of, of the orchestra. So it's a very interesting, I know, right? Um, and so they and they're trying to build a community of of concert goers that um, are there to just enjoy the experience of the music. And uh, I guess technically very historically informed because that's actually how the music was uh, originally written um, to be. And what they found was that people aren't on their phones texting the whole time. In fact, they, they, they rarely did do a lot of Instagram. They weren't Instagramming the whole thing, like, you know, like as if they're at a rave or something. But they, they they would film the 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 conductor walking on and the and the orchestra tuning and then maybe they they would have their phones ready and just film the end of the movement so they, the audience just intuitively knew but they spoke to each other and said you know wow that that pianist they're they're amazing or that trumpet player he split a note. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's Very count. bold of you to presume that the pianist didn't split a note. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, what are your thoughts on that? Because that's the only orchestra that I know that exists that does that. Um, I mean, I'd be curious to know if you, if you guys know of an orchestra that does that. It's interesting. It reminds me of that thing where um, when you're given... When something is not allowed, it suddenly is very exciting to do, like taking a photo in a concert or te- you know, getting your phone out because you're bored and texting someone. And yet when you're given that permission, it's somehow not so interesting or, or you know, exciting anymore. So you just you have that option and it's okay, but you're not sort of going there out of desperation because you're, you're bored or whatever. You, 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 you have it there and then you can... Um, choose to use it as you want as opposed to like when the usher is not looking or whatever i person i i don't know the talking thing if everyone around me was talking i think there would have to be a very clever sound set up so that i could still hear what the orchestra was saying without like someone very loudly behind me commenting through the whole thing and being allowed to do that um so yeah, they're at the development now and it's like literally commenting the whole way <laughs> yeah yeah exactly it's just like a, a, a you know, running commentary sort of thing. And then someone over there is doing the same thing. Um, so as long as the acoustics were made in such a way that you could still hear it clearly, I, I don't know, even with, um, well, I don't know, even on the backs of the seats, if there was little mics or amps or whatever, um, something like that, or if, or if people wanted to be extra chatty, they went to a certain part of the hall or something like that. I think it's a good idea. I just, I think you'd have to accommodate people who wouldn't want that. On the other hand, since being quiet is the status quo, you could argue that the people who want to go to quiet concerts have all of these concerts available. So, you know, why, why, why complain that one concert that you go to or one orchestra makes it that, that, makes that their thing? So. Yeah, and, I, and I'm wondering, is that, because I haven't really looked into them that much, um, does that accra- attract a different crowd? And if so, does that crowd then say right well actually you know what classical music is actually really exciting and then may, may, maybe th- this this orchestra you know their, their, their mission and their aim is to bring in people who otherwise are 
you know, intimidated by a classical concert atmosphere. And then they say, you know what, it's actually not, not, not as bad as I thought. And then they maybe it's a, a learning program for them to come to more concerts because obviously one orchestra can't play everything. Well, this is a really interesting point because I think the strictures of classical music performances, whether implied or stated explicitly, unfortunately often have the effect of turning away potential audience members. It breaks my heart when I say to a non-musician friend, hey, listen, I've got an extra ticket to the SSO tonight. Do you want to come? And they say, oh, sorry, no, I'm not trained. Mm. Why should you need to be trained to enjoy Beethoven 9? Why should you need to be trained to enjoy Mahler 2? It's crazy stuff. This music was written, well, in Mahler's case, explicitly to contain the world. Y you shouldn't need to be trained to be in that world, let alone relate to it. I didn't know about this Phoenix initiative. I find it fascinating. Like Olivia, I have all sorts of practical questions. My musician's anxiety brain is just going into overdrive <laughs> thinking about how you would, you know, work around those questions. But as a gesture of bringing people to classical music, I don't mind it. I kind of feel though this is the sort of thing that might make a hypocrite out of me it's the sort of thing that i would love to see others do but i'm not sure whether i would sign up to be the musician or one of the musicians mm. playing that concert because i think that while the audience might enjoy it i would find that kind of thing quite distracting i am not ashamed to admit that things happening in the audience do affect my concentration when I'm playing. And obviously that's something that we all have to learn to deal with and be able to recover from. But I mean, I think it's quite a universal experience in some ways. If there's going to be a memory slip in somebody's recital, it's probably going to be when grandma's phone went off. It's a pretty ubiquitous experience. So I think while I love the gesture of that concert and I would be absolutely fascinated to go and see one of those concerts. And in fact, I have a mate who's in Phoenix right now. I'm literally going to message him right after this and ask if he's been to one of those concerts. But I don't know whether I, in my performer's kind of position, wearing the performer hat, whether that would necessarily be the concert that I would want to do as my next gig. Uh, yeah, I could not agree more um, with what you were saying about people not feeling sort of qualified to go and enjoy a classical music concert. And I remember reading a study that was on, um, I don't know if I said this on air in our last podcast or not. So anyway, bear with me if I did. But um, th where they were looking at newcomers' reactions to their first classical concert. And a lot of them would already feel a little ill at ease because of all these customs and how people are acting and these strictures, these kind of ritualistic aspects of it um, that they were not familiar with and so weren't sure if they could blend in. And then they were also not sure what they sort of should be listening for or what how they should be acting or what was sort of going on. And they felt guilty for that. And they thought, well, I, this is my fault because I shouldn't be here and I don't really belong here and I just don't know this kind of music. It's sort of a self-disqualifying thing and I, it's not just about the strictures themselves but i think the strictures also reflect a way of thinking about that kind of music that i think most people engaged in other forms of art which everyone is everyone goes to movies everyone goes to you know some kinds of concert enjoys something um sets the classical world a little apart from that where it is a kind of overarching ideology of like well look we're going to hear some lovely brahms this is brahms brahms is a genius this music is wonderful uh you should already know a bunch of stuff about it if you don't here's a program note it'll tell you about brahms and his life and why you should like it and here are our performers dressed in black who are going to come out and give this piece of art to us it's wonderful whereas i, I thought it was so interesting you were talking about phoenix how there was it brought focus to the musicians and sort of what oh here's the conductor here's what these people are doing this is our orchestra that's so interesting who's in our orchestra these you know they're from our town that's so cool uh, you know how how are they playing it how long have they what what do they like about their instrument and suddenly that it brings in that community aspect much more explicitly and i think it asks important questions of how 
people doing these kinds of concerts um, are thinking of this kind of music and how we actually take what is meaningful from this kind of music is it the fact that it's that we're preserving amazing art from hundreds of years ago maybe maybe that's part of it is there room to in the kind of status quo classical concert to include more of what it actually means to us and our performers and the impact it has on us as a as a community yeah that's interesting classical musicians i i I just think it Thinking about what you're saying, the classical concerts that your lay person really does enjoy is the stuff that classical musicians don't really respect, like Andre Rio, that sort of thing, <laughs> which is, you know, and they're really performative and they're really, they're, they're playing the part of the classical uh, the classical performer, which, you know, they've got, you know, in Andre Rio's orchestra, they've got the ladies dressed in like 18th century, 19th century sort of gowns and everything. And people think, oh, yes, this is classical music. This is waltzy, schmaltzy, you know. And so I guess, the but it works. I mean, people attend that and, and, and people enjoy that. And he's probably, yeah. So how do we bring together that aspect of music that is more classical music, that is more inclusive or is more audience friendly with the good quality sort of oral experience that we, that musicians sort of, uh, crave or, or respect I think and this is just my personal opinion apropos the likes of Andre Rieu the absolute unmitigated pretentious scorn which proper classical musicians direct towards the likes of Andre Rieu and those who support him is absolutely the worst thing we can do for our cause Snobbery never helps. We were talking, actually, you, you, I think, listed it as one of the headings of this particular podcast, inclusion and exclusion. The sense of exclusion, the sense of discrimination, in a way, is never good in society. It never brings any positive outcomes, really. And I think the same goes for music. And I think, as in so many elements of human interaction, tolerance is the key here. If somebody wants to go to an Andre Rio concert and they really enjoy their Andre Rio concert, then I think we, as, shall we say, more traditional classical musicians, should be happy for them. Mm. Should say that's great. In the same way as if our friend goes to Ariana Grande, mm. then you know we, we might love Ari- Ariana Grande despite doing a lot of Beethoven or we might absolutely detest Ariana Grande. We, that's somewhat irrelevant. But we should just be able to have the tolerance and I you know I, I would say respect in a way just respect for individual tastes and preferences and individual people hey to say yeah great if you had a great night at Andre Rio that's awesome and I think the less barriers and divisions we can put up the better exactly the less barriers we can put up the better and I think it it does start quite young um, with our music programs I mean Richard Gill was a huge advocate mm. for enriching students understanding in music uh from the young age of you know however young you can be um <laughs> i went to his kids concerts when i was tiny right the, the proms were, yeah, were yeah, 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 yeah 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 and you know one could argue oh this music is um cliche maybe or it's overdone or it's really simple air quotes um but what it does it teaches people from a young age to appreciate this music you know he, If you want to make smart people, um, as in peoples, um, teach them music rather than teach them coding is 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 the new thing. You know the the huge huge movement towards all kids have got to learn how to code and it'll make society better. And actually, you know, music does. You know, having people who are more emotionally intelligent rather than numbers intelligent actually leads to a a better society, at least I think. And so, I think the less barriers we can remove the more, or well, the better, so I, I like to think that, you know, if more people saw wider ranges of music, because I think everyone has a tendency to listen to what they want always. And I'm a huge, out of, I, I, list, I actively push myself to listen to rap by Hobson, who is very, you know, lots, lots of profanity everywhere. And then I will listen to, uh, and then I'll go, li- my, and then I'll listen to J-pop, and then I'll listen to um Greek music, and then I'll listen to Gamelan, and then I'll listen to my classical music. And I think, I like to think that because of this experience of being able to see as many concerts as possible, I'm, I'm a better person for it. And so I think what we need to, it's a broader, it's a broader picture of 
maybe not just encourage people to see classical music, but see encourage people to see everything, including jazz. I mean, how often people people don't quite see jazz at their pub anymore. And I always go to those because I think, you know, I don't know much about jazz. Uh, all I know is seventh chords and maybe ninth and oh, 11th, don't go there. But I can appreciate it. And the more I go, the more I appreciate it. And then I, I used to be scared of it in, in high school and in, in, in early uni of jazz concerts and go, oh, I don't really know what's happening. And oh, everyone's clapping now. Why does it, why is everyone clapping now? They Oh, they've they got a solo, but we're not meant to clap. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I guess the question is people, your average non-musician listens to music for relaxation. And do you think people really want to listen to something they have to learn to listen to? Like... You know, there's so much music that's immediately appealing. And even though we find classical music immediately appealing, there's so many thousands of hours of understanding why it's appealing or what we can listen to. I guess I guess it's a question, you know, I, I imagine my non-musician's friends and they they have to learn about enough already. Do they want to learn about another thing in order to in order to have to go to, in order to go to a concert or even they might listen to like something classical on Spotify but they don't have to learn about the etiquette or or sort of pay the well the cost is a different thing but <laughs> sort of they don't they want to have a taste of that without without feeling like they need to try and blend in in a type of society or a type of etiquette that they don't feel comfortable in yeah i agree and i think in terms of appreciation what cl- classical music can do a bit better is lend lend itself better to being appreciated by more people and just sort of embedding itself better in most people's just going about their day-to-day lives idea of something that would be cool to check out cool to listen to cool to maybe bring their kids to have their kids learn an instrument so on and so forth and then at least even if you're not formally trained but the sound of it and the that whole world and hopefully it's a world that doesn't look so restrictive and and prescriptive and and all of this is more is is um is in their heads as something like yeah this was part of my childhood we went to see you know the our i don't know the big orchestra or the local orchestra and we played this and that's that's already part of um part of ordinary life in a way that classical music classical music kind of isn't um and yeah, and in terms, of, I don't know what Phoenix does in terms of their programming, but I think I think there is some classical music that could well be immediately accessible. Um, and I think there are things that you would perform if you were doing it in a more Phoenix sort of style, where there are pieces that would lend itself better to that kind of setting than others. Um, and so, and I yeah, I think. The benefit of things like that, and even the benefit of um, of an Andre Ria style concert, and I fully agree. If, if whoever enjoys going to those, and that's a meaningful experience for them, that's that's great. Um, I also don't think the dichotomy of what we're talking about should be between the classical concert and the Andre Ria, and um, you know, and I don't think Andre, you know, Andre Ria is the face of progressive classical music or or something like that. And there, are, you know, it's not really my thing, and there are reasons that it's m- not my thing independent of how close it is to a sort of typical classical concert. I think it's interesting in a way because a lot of, you know, people sort of come out in these very stylized, like, you know, ball gowns and it's all, there's a chandelier and it's all, it's, it's, it is, it's in its own way, sort of very aristocratic and, and glitzy and richer. I think it plays off uh, the, the average person's sort of idea of what classical music is and what world it's coming from. And I think, if when people don't like that and they think it's kitschy, it's sort of an indication to them to maybe sever the link between classical music and that sort of world. And yeah, just broaden out, not either have, oh, this kind of concert or that kind of concert, but just have a much, much broader pool of where you can find and where you can enjoy this music. So that kind of music is not so bound to a particular look. Yeah, it's interesting. Um When you were saying about integrated into everyday lives, I was just thinking about in Europe, where, of course, most of this music comes from, where composers are kind of not just composers, they're national heroes in a way. So, for example, in Poland, everyone knows Chopin. You sit on a bench walking down the main street and it will play you a Chopin waltz. You go into the, uh, like, metro and sometimes there'll be Chopin on the, just, like, in the... Like in the metro thing itself. The airport's named after Chopin. It is, exactly. <laughs> and, you know, same same with like uh, Weimar, with the Goethe, Schiller, yeah, Liszt, yeah. all of that. Um, you know, it, it's everywhere. It's impossible to escape. So I wonder, would 
would it, it do you think that um maybe that classical music integration into everyday life would come easier in Australia if we had more support for Australian grown or or cultural Australian classical musicians rather than always from Europe well it's interesting because in Europe every town has its orchestra yeah um, yeah and I was talking with I would think I'm not sure if we said it on air or not but we were talking about this notion that every town has its own orchestra and it's a very communal thing whereas here in Sydney uh, we have our SSO we have our TMO and we have we have about like we have a handful of we have a handful of orchestras but it, it feels very much that every big city has one orchestra I've even heard people say to me who are not who are not classical musicians saying oh is the opera does the opera house actually do music people I'm not even joking um, and so it comes to this awareness thing of like we've got to really start I mean meet the music's brilliant for what it is it's really interesting how it's changed a lot now as a teacher I see it now it's, it's like half the length of what it used to be um, it's a lot more fun and a lot more edgy, I guess. Um, I mean, I, we were watching the Rite of Spring and it was a bit weird. Uh, the person who came, I can't remember her name, but she was like, <laughs> like this piece is edgy. And I was like, are you trying to... So it was a, they were overstepping, I think. They were just trying to go too far in one direction. I forgot where I was going with that. Um, I was talking about the Opera House and uh, people, pe people still, you know, wondering do concerts still happen. Literally no, but I think I think it's right that you that you touched on that because ma Australia in particular maybe doesn't have the benefit of a world transcending artist like Goethe or Schiller or, or Chopin. Not you know, not that Australia doesn't have fantastic artists, um, but uh, we do have the benefit of maybe the most iconic opera house in the world yeah, at right. least the <laughs> image and i think yeah and that's part of the i think that's an indication of something we're missing and that a lot of the general public obviously knows of it as a iconic building but there's a disconnect between the music that happens in it and um and i think it's would be a mistake to blame that on the general public for one second that's the that's uh the world that is engaging in that music i think it's an opportunity to, to sort of broaden its horizons and make that particular building and maybe the, the the art form that that building represents sort of have its doors blown open and represent something that is a lot more inclusive and a lot more accessible. Because at the moment, I agree, it feeds into this idea of if you want to get a taste of this kind of music, you have to buy a very, very expensive ticket and, you know, do it, come to Sydney City and, and sort of spend it. It, it becomes this you know, this expensive and sort of, I don't know, day out in the city. And if you don't live near or in the city or don't do it that much, it's sort of, it's already, it, it's unhelpful that you kind of are transporting yourself to a kind of a, a different place and a, and a place that maybe is disconnected from what you think of what's meaningful to you and your, your ordinary life. Mm. And it's interesting because, you know, we, you've got the Penrith Symphony Orchestra, you've got, you know, St. Saint, uh, Saint George Chamber Orchestra, you've got... Uh, Willoughby, all these orchestras which are really good, but people. But I think the difference is that people don't view them. They they view them quite, unfortunately, a bit lower than you know SSO and stuff like that. Whereas I mean I haven't been to Europe, so I don't really know the the, the vibe. But I have been told that you know it's more of an even playing ground over there with orchestras and people people tend to view them more equally uh, again I, I don't know I've only been told this and yeah it's, it's just very interesting and like you said Enrico about you know we haven't really unfortunately got like our Beethoven because you know we're quite a young nation space you know compared, well, uh, 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 the in, like, 60,000 60, years, yeah. years uh, <laughs> in the cla uh, like in the classical music sphere I mean in terms of producing music for orchestras we're quite a young nation compared to other um, countries that, that exist and that's why they've got their Beethovens whereas our composers and we've got great composers but they're really in the last hundred years or so well, this is the thing. I think it connects to some degree to questions of Australian identity because if we are judging ourselves from a colonial perspective, our European identity is, as you say, very young, but the identity of our Indigenous peoples and of our land is, is very old. Mm -hmm. And the tricky thing here is that Classical music is generally used to mean Western classical music. Yeah. If you want music from other cultures, it's generally described in terms of those cultures, which is in and of itself 
problematic in all sorts of ways <laughs> as a label. The idea that you need to be you need to be white to be classical. If you're not white, you're not you're not a classic. Sorry. I mean that idea is is very very problematic. But I don't think that's something that's limited to the classical music scene in this country. I think this is linked to questions of our own national identity and obviously there's been lots of talk recently with the rewriting of the history curriculum and such with mm. culture wars and all of that. But in a way, I think also that gives Australia the foundation to create a kind of synthesised and diverse musical culture. The fact that we have a foot in the door of, shall we say, European colonialism, but we also have this extraordinary Aboriginal culture, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island culture, that has its own riches in terms of music and in terms of all the arts, really, that is there to be celebrated and enjoyed and drawn upon in all sorts of ways. And I think a lot of Australian composers in recent years have been making an attempt to do that. Certainly Sculthorpe was, I mean, it's not really recent years, but he was obsessed with, obsessed with traditional First Nations kind of music and, and all of that. But I wonder how practically that plays out with the kind of Western classical canon that a lot of these subscription concert goers are fundamentally going for. You know, if you're the kind of person who only goes to an SSO concert because you want to hear Beethoven 5, then if you don't get your Beethoven 5, then you might not renew your subscription and the orchestra might not have the money to put on the programs next year. Yeah. And this is where um, programs are also, I think, that's, that, that's a huge thing I'm hearing a lot in the... Well, amongst our peers, really, or amongst a lot of people, about how auctions orcs are basically forced into how they program for their subscri for their people who subscribe to their concert series. And that's something I've kind of been proud of with, the, with, with Modest, um, is that I've always believed that, you know, you need, I've always operated ha choosing our rep on three pillars, which is, yes, your canon works, which are good and ultimately do hook in people, I guess. Uh, you have your gems that people don't quite know and they should really know that often quite underappreciated, undervalued and people just go, wait, that exists and they listen and go, how do I not know about this? For example, um, Symphony Number no. 1 by Johann de Mage, titled the, the Lord of the Rings. People don't know that this came before the movies and actually um, came about five years after the books um, and is, in my opinion, far superior than the, 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 than, the, um, than the movie soundtrack, but people just don't know it. And then there's the third pillar for me, which is uh, new works by new composers, fresh of various age groups, you know, older, younger, whatever, just new pieces written. And so, and I guess we have the luxury of that because we don't have regular concerts and we don't have people who subscribe and, and donors who donate millions of dollars, billions, uh, I don't know, I'm joking. I uh, hope they do. Uh, please do. Um, support the industry. Um, <laughs> Anyone listening will give you our bank details whenever you want. Yes, exactly. <laughs> because we haven't got, we, we, we've got the luxury of, like, of not having that burden, I guess you could say, of feeling expectations. Um, we have the luxury to program however, however we want. I know some, and not push ourselves to do things that we don't want to do. I'm thinking of lockdown, how a lot of auctions were forced really to do online concerts because they had those subscribers um, and they were forced to do those online videos, which ridiculous. Like if you thought putting on a concert was hard, holy wow, try putting on an online concert. But yet in a sense, those video concerts actually did some really, really good work in bringing classical music to people who might not otherwise have heard it. Melbourne Digital Concert Hall. I mean, what a wonderful initiative. And how often people, even now, who, whom I know, will tune into an MDCH program and download it and listen to it when it's more convenient for them, but not rock up to an actual live concert. Certainly we've done that at home. Certainly. And particularly because now as we emerge from lockdowns but the pandemic is still very much in force and COVID is still circulating, there's a lot of anxiety around concertgoers about live concerts from a public health perspective 
particularly given the fact that, look, I'm sorry to say it, but in classical music, it tends to be a more senior audience that we have. And they are the people who would be right to be more worried about COVID because they're at more risk from COVID. So I think while digital concerts, online concerts, Zoom concerts, live stream concerts, pre-recorded concerts, whatever, can be a major pain for the performers and really cannot compete in terms of the X factor of non-verbal communication between performers and listeners with a live concert, I actually think it's not been a terrible thing for the world and for classical music that they've come about. Yeah, I wonder whether the future of classical music will be, you know, much like in pop or jazz is a little different because it's so associated with bars and, and pubs and stuff. But w will the future look like we've got, you know, Vienna, London, Berlin and Philharmonica and those are the only ones, just like the, well, or, you know, a few more. Those are the main uh, pop star orchestras or whatever. And most of the time you're just listening on Spotify or to like digital concerts and stuff. But then once every several years, someone will come over and that will be the big event. Much like, you know, when, some, when Taylor Swift comes for a concert, that's like a huge event. And people only see them like once, maybe twice in, in, in their lives sort of thing, or at least in a decade. Is that the future? I'm not advocating for it. It's just, I wonder. It could well be. And it's interesting. I, I think you, you three know I released an album of my own recently that was only released online that was only streamed on Spotify and Apple Music and Tidal and Deezer and all those sorts of things. They're, we're just not making a CD. And it was because the record label took the view that they weren't doing that during the pandemic because this was happening earlier in the year when, when it was actually being made. And they just said, look, where are you going to sell your CDs? What concerts are on that you can sell your CDs after? I mean, for those of us here on the Eastern Seaboard of Australia, we're in lockdown for, what, four months, three and a half months, no concerts at all. And, you know, I mean, it's sad in a sense because CDs are lovely and CDs are cool and you can actually hold it in your hot little hand and that's, that's lovely. But pragmatically speaking, to a large extent, this is the way the music industry is going, streaming. Because you can download it and you can listen to it on the bus. You can listen to it while you're on your run. You know, you can listen to it any time. And again... It's a double-edged sword because on the one hand, on the one hand, hand, on the one hand, it's doing wonderful work because it's bringing classical music into contexts where you wouldn't otherwise have found it. On the other hand, though, it's actually making classical music less of an event, taking the sheen off it. And this is another thing I, I'd love to talk to you guys about, which is that one of the things that crossed my mind when we were talking about Andre Rieu's concerts is that they're real events. You're not just going to listen. You're going to look. And Olivia, this ties in beautifully to your PhD, so I, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. One of the things that I think is sad about this move towards recordings rather than live performances, and also in general the fact that so many live concerts are nothing more than that. You know, there might be a a bar which is reasonably well stocked at the interval and that's about all. And I think one of the things that draws people to concerts and draws people to arts events in general is the fact that it's kind of like a multi-sensory experience in the sense that you're not just going to listen to Emmanuel Axe play, a CD, Emmanuel Axe play Beethoven 5. You're actually going to mingle with people and sample some beautiful wine at the interval and have an ice cream or there might be nibbles, there might be cheese. There are all sorts of things. You might even meet someone gorgeously attractive at the concert. I mean, the, all of these things play into what draws a person to go to a concert, the event of the concert. And I'd, li I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts on that because the whole idea of people listening with their eyes is your research interest yeah well um so just because you guys might not know penny and Enrico, so there's a lot of research which is sort of scientific type of stuff where you have stimulus and stuff which shows that 
We are in so many different ways affected by what we see over what we hear when we see a concert. For example, the way someone walks on stage immediately biases for or against them. People, professional musicians and novices alike can't, can't you know, give the place uh, the prize winners places like one, two, three when they're listening to the recordings, but when they watch them without listening, they can place them at one, two, three. And then if they watch and listen to them, they're, they're a sort of medium success rate. So that's sort of that's sort of one thing. But recently I've been researching, or last year I was researching what do performing musicians think about? Like, do they, uh, do they have this idea that we are so almost brainwashed by in tertiary education that you only ever think about the music? You know, you, 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 when you practice, you prepare just the beautiful phrases. You don't practice performing and such. I was wondering what, what professional musicians, like, you know, ones who just perform only for money, uh, how, they, how they think about it. And I found that they they think about the spectacle. They are super aware that people come, like there was this wonderful quote from one of them that um, maybe 5% of people come truly for the music. The rest come from the spectacle, that for the social aspect, for the, for the onstage, you know, drama. And, and so, it, you know, it was interesting to find that they didn't just prepare the music as an abstraction. They do for a CD, and they actually said that that was way harder because you don't have anything that you can communicate with, with with people, just the music, right? And so they preferred playing in concerts to recordings. Um, but in the concerts, when they were practicing, they were sort of imagining how they'd look from the audience, how the audience would, like, you know, I, I term this introspection and et extrospection. So introspections or their experience on stage. What will I see? What will I hear? What will the lights look like? What will the audience look like? What am I, what do I need to prepare or practice for? Because I'm not practicing for a recording where I just play an abstraction. I'm preparing for an event. And then extrospection, where they imagine what will the audience see? What will they see when I walk on stage? Will they, what will they see when I'm like wearing the clothes I'm wearing? Will it look good? How will I, um, what will they see when I'm, like the way they're experiencing arrest or something like that? Will they see someone who looks insecure? Will they see someone who looks in suspense or whatever? So they re video recorded themselves even to check this uh, regularly. And so it, it's interesting. It, it, it kind of occurred to me that, that I agree that it, it is the whole spectacle of performance and almost by getting so into the music and analyzing it as when you're in tertiary, it almost brings, it, it, it creates this disconnect between the concert itself and the music, um, which then of course makes it even more dramatic like talking about the visuals and stuff when it shouldn't be. It's a, this is not revolutionary. All throughout history, you saw and you, you know, heard people playing music at the same time. It's just since recording that you're able to sort of abstract it out or, you know, look at the score or whatever. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'd like to hear Enrico's perspective because, like, has your perspective of concerts changed from when you were performing and practicing on a really regular basis to now not so much uh, and more of a music, I don't want to say a music appreciator because you're always a musician, or if it, but, um, not, but, um, but l one that's not performing anymore. Does that change your perspective? Has, has your perspective of concerts as a whole evolved with that or has it basically stayed the same? I think when you're in it you're and you're thinking about what you're going to do, you're thinking in a certain parameter like you're not I don't know I was never but it also like I just was younger and not sort of thinking about this so much but it's sort of you know what and if you don't think I think this is the the gold nugget in what Olivia is doing in the, is that even if you don't think of it consciously even if you claim to do the total opposite which so many musicians do where it's oh, I don't really it's all about the music for me I'm not really interested in that stuff um, and yet I'm sure they put in the expected amount of time into choosing what you know suit they're going to wear um, and you know they don't even acknowledge but because that's the dress code and they know that um, and practicing walks and you know and there's all sorts of things that that you can say in that in that vein and I was doing a similar sort of thing to the point where um something simple like a small subversion of um well, I've done this from time to time I've seen others do it too like you sort of you bow and then maybe you start your first piece before the applause has died down which is um which is subversive enough that it's interesting, but it's such a small, you know, kind of nuanced play on what the current codes are that it's it's kind of acceptably subversive, you know. And so you sort of think in these things, and I guess I me mean, not 
performing at this point, but still, you know, still listening, still sort of tuning in, still having conversations like this, you sort of, I'm able to zoom out and kind of appreciate more what performances of that kind of world are like with respect to music in general. Um, And yeah, and it's this sort of, I think, to draw a comparison to, um, I remember reading a study when I was still um, doing music research on the the identity of live music uh, in the pop world in respect of the digitization of you know that kind of music um just like all like all music and it sort of shows like live pop music is doing fine like it's you know people go they love it because it's those kind of events like it is an event it is not just you're going to see a cd writ large it is um like that experience is so packed with real life narrative experience that the stream or the download doesn't have it's you know it's it's um it's a really formative moment you're going to see your art your artist is going to be in your city you're going to see them you're going to see people you're going to you know um it's 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 a whole thing that where classical music seems to us seems to have prioritized making about about just the music so much and and shirking away from all of that that it does end up confronted with this idea that, okay, then what is the live performance actually giving us if it is all about the music? Um, and so that's, yeah, that's the tension it's sort of having to battle with. Yeah, not only only not only not is it only about the music, it also sort of eschews, eschews, eschews the performer themselves, you know, they're yeah. just a conduit for the music. So you don't go to see, you know... Um, Yuja Wang, well, maybe Yuja Wang's an, an exception, but you don't go we to see... We can talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> you don't go to see whatever, Olivia, you go to see Beethoven sort of through this vessel. Well, that's that's exactly right. And I was actually going to add on the subject of any musical performance being more than just a CD plus visuals. A little anecdote. Even when making a CD... When I was making that recording, we would have very long rehearsal days. It was every Sunday, and we would start about 11 a.m., and we'd, we'd go until about 5 p.m. And we would have been going the whole time with maybe an hour for lunch. It's incredibly tiring. It's incredibly enervating. And at the end of the first day, my producer said to me, OK, I, I want you to do another full run of this piece. It was Beethoven 109. I said, with a few fallen words added in, you've got to be kidding me. And she said, no, 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 no. And I said, but how can I do this? And she said to me, this is the con, right? Yeah. She said, well, you're a student there, aren't you? Yeah. Well, well get a friend to come in. Right. So I went and rounded up some poor soul in piano land who was looking innocent and got him to come down in the hall. And then Brooke, the producer, said to me, now, do you have any other clothes with you? And I'm like, well, actually, I think I do have something in my locker. She's like, well, go and change your clothes. Anyway, what was happening, of course, is she was trying to set it up like, like a concert, like a live performance. And I went back in, completely exhausted, of course, from the day and over it. And I played with my friend in the audience. And I walked out back to the room where she and the engineer were. And they said, great, that's going to be our master take. Thanks very much. And I didn't, I didn't think I had it in me to play again. And the, the scary thing was, I didn't even think I played well in that take. Now, of course, there were things we edited. It wasn't just that straight onto the album. Obviously, there were edits. But I just found it so interesting that even when it is in the can, even when it is just a recording, it is not a concert, those small accoutrements of what makes a concert, what makes a performance, do have an effect, clearly. I mean, I heard the recordings myself. It was chalk and cheese. They absolutely have an effect on how you as the performer play let alone how the responders respond to it yeah that's so interesting that you mentioned that because in these interviews some of the really interesting things that they were saying was you know i was the what they were wearing was very important to to getting into the character of performer soloist and not just playing for yourself but playing for others so you know I, there were some beautiful quotes like you know if I was wearing my track pants and you know my sweat sweatshirt or whatever I might feel better I might feel more relaxed but I certainly wouldn't play as well because you know or like the the gown or whatever I wear on stage is like an armor it's it, or not like an armor but a um like a costume or it's it's sort of my it's my it's what I wear to play music well sort of thing. So 
it's it is funny because it's 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 not just visual it's also kinesthetic it's that feel of the clothing the feel of being on stage the you know the heat of the light all that sort of thing it's part of what makes what what prepares you for peak performance if you think of athletes for example <laughs> they wouldn't just be wearing whatever in their training session whatever shoes and then on the day just oh no I just think about the running I don't think about my performance like <laughs> thing and I, I think yeah I think you know, there is this sense that the research that I'm doing, for example, and the visual stuff is kind of, oh, I don't know, divisive or like um, subterfuge sort of thing to the whole music thing. But if if you think about it, just like any other peak performance activity where everything you do matters, it's somehow much less divisive because it's, it's not about saying that you have to be extremely expressive or wear like extremely unusual clothes or whatever, but it's just being aware that these are things that add to performance. It's really interesting how you mentioned how, you know, you're donning some armor and mm. you put it on and it, like, it, it kind of, I don't think it, it's, it's not protecting you, but it's, it's comforting you. I, I know I put on my suit and, you know, it's a bit tight around the shoulders. Uh, not too tight. Um, no, I'm not getting weight. No, don't worry. Um, <laughs> there's a certain restrictiveness about it and, it, and it, it makes you feel that I'm in clothing that is optimizing me for this activity um much like an athlete is wearing clothing that you know optimizes their performance for exactly. and so we, we've gone into we've i just want to try and bring it back to audiences somehow and people's um thing and that from my perspective is you know when i'm conducting you know it's all about this not a habit um this ritual thing that you do you put on you put on your, your suit you tighten it up you can't breathe quite as well um and the audience kind of um I guess expects that a little bit as they do with a with a with a with a with a sporting event. You know, they go there and they're like, look 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 at look at Usain Bolt with his um, specific spikes, and you know, you, and you go there and you like and you appreciate every everything about him, his performance, his his demeanor, he um, like what is he wearing? Is like right. Well, I appreciate that, that 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 that's part of the whole thing, and then you learn to associate that with, with, with a bit of enjoyment for the event. And I think it's the same thing from an audience perspective about the thing. They don't go there to see someone dressed up in a suit because they could just go to a ball or they could just go to a, a club or something where everyone's dressed up um, for a different reason. But they go there because they're like, they like they go to see an, a performance of people, you know, in, in maybe penguin suits or, um, or, or in all black if they're, if they're in a musical pit who are optimising themselves or a before. New Zealand rugby player. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly. Um, <laughs> exactly. There you go. Rugby. Uh, they optimize themselves to do that task to the best of their ability, and that, as an audience member, I guess makes you more engaged in it. Well, completely. And one thing I wanted to raise, apropos the dynamics of audiences and, shall we say, the average Joe towards classical music, which I think is a nice, I guess, segue back into our main topic for this podcast, is the issue of, you could call it the charge of superficiality, the charge of trashiness, the idea that is so prevalent among classical musicians that the minute you start thinking about anything but the music, you are becoming trashy. You're becoming superficial. I was reminded of this when you mentioned Yu Jia Wang because you guys may or may not have seen it but there's been a lot of backlash in the classical music community particularly on social media this week following an article by the well-known critic Norman Lebrecht on Yu Jia Wang's attire and why he objects to what she wears so much and the article has been incredibly controversial and branded probably rightly as misogynistic. The idea that a man can wear whatever he damn well wants and if he plays really well, we accept that and just by the by, there's only so much that male performers in classical music tend to wear anyway. It's kind of like, would you like a white shirt or a black shirt tonight? Whereas with female performers and women in the public image in general, we impose these kinds of relentless sort of objectifying beauty standards, which really 
don't help. But I find Yu Jia Wang's case very interesting because, okay, even if we cut out the Norman Lebrecht esque, low key misogynistic, low key racist rhetoric about, oh, how terrible it is that I can see her legs when she's playing Brahms too. Certainly, I think a part of who Yu Jia Wang is as a performer and a part of the experience for the audience, and I say audience rather than listeners very advisedly here, is what she wears. Part of the vibe of her performance being, dare I say, fun. There's something fun about a Yuja concert. There's something edgy about it. There's something progressive in many ways. Is it just because of her lightning quick articulation and her sometimes unorthodox phrasing and her very clear crystalline sort of sound? Or is it also the fact that when she's playing from the score, there's an iPad rather than, uh, you know, a book? Now, admittedly, that's gaining greater currency. And particularly, is it the fact that she's wearing really, really short miniskirts in amazing fluoro colours and dresses split at the leg? Does that bear on the experience. I think it does. And I don't think that's necessarily a negative thing. I think it's the experience that she wants. And if that's the experience she wants to create, good for her. And if audiences love that, good for her. And if audiences don't like it, well, go and watch, I don't know, Gary Olsen or somebody. <laughs> you know what I mean? Get ripped, Gary Olsen. No, no, I don't, I don't mean to downplay Gary Olsen, by the way. He's one of my, one of my favourite musicians. I'm just saying that he's very much in that kind of traditional mould. He's an old white man, you know, he wears black and white tucks and tails. I, I, I just think that he's of a, of a different ilk to you, Ja. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, this directly relates to my honours study exactly. um, where, you know, I, I got someone in a long black dress, a kind of baggy suit that is my mum's from the 80s. You, you can imagine, like, the shoulder pads and stuff mm. and, um, and a short black dress. All of them could be considered fairly formal attire there wasn't like sequins or glitter you know they were just normal black and I got people to rate them on like musicality technique overall performance appropriateness of dress and um you know perhaps predictably the the short dress was the lowest rated in all categories but what was more interesting was the interviews which um oh and I forgot to mention the audio was dubbed throughout so it wasn't like you know it wasn't the performances in the short dress were no different to the performances in the other oh, in so the other clothes. The audio was exactly the same. It was right, exactly. It was dubbed. So, so um, you know, people's perceptions, and I, I'm not saying that anyone is stupid or unaware or anything like that because I would do the exact same thing. I mean, if if 30 of 30 people did that, I have no doubt that I would be you know, exactly doing the same. But their perceptions of the style of the music playing was different. They, they, they said that the ones in the short dress sounded kind of more fun or more suited to, um, there was a Bach, a Mozart and an Albanian. So they said more suited to the Albanian and the more, you know, um, and they weren't even talking about the dress necessarily, but the performances in the short dress just as a way of identifying them. So it, it's, it's, it's interesting. It does affect the way you see it. And, you know, that goes for everything. If you go to, if you give a, a pitch for a business and you're wearing funky clothes they're going to see a very different image of the business to or an interview to someone who uh, wears a suit and they both have individual merits you know the suit would be more traditional whatever the the short funky bright colors whatever it would have more of a youthful sort of vibe if you, it, it's you know it's it's just basic psychology. We're super affected by what we're seeing. Of course. People, yeah. people, people judge people's style. Yeah, people yeah. read into people's That's personality. Right. And you choose clothing. I mean, look at us. We're all wearing shirts and, like, you know, we're not wearing swimmers. It's it's common sense. I <laughs> didn't think about that on the way here. I was like, I should have worn my swimmers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ne next episode. Ne next, next episode. episode okay. It's going to have to be, you know. Everyone in speed up. <laughs> yeah. So it's just, yeah, it's a conscious choice you make every day. And, and audiences... You know, just like we do in normal life, they immediately read that. Same with, like, demeanour and stuff. If you look nervous walking on stage, then the audience reads that as much as you see someone nervous, you know, in day-to-day. -day. It's it's Everything ties into it, and you, even on a subliminal level. Yeah, and I think that um, does play a factor into why people aren't as, I guess, not daring. I guess they, they, they don't want to explore classical music as much because they see what they're wearing in general and they go oh, i don't really wear suits um i don't have a penguin suit i don't have a penguin suit myself um <laughs> so and there, there's no 
there's no connection there on on that level, and because they can't um, relate with the performance on that level, they tend to other it, and they're like, oh well, they're wearing something else. Uh, whereas I guess you know when th there's a tendency to see you know different um, like pop music, for example, they're wearing the same clothes as me. Well, they're with the same people. Like you know, they, 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 it's it's a very interesting thing. Uh, I am conscious of the time that we are going well over an hour. Oh, has the computer run out of power? No. Um, the Mac will sleep soon unless plugged into a PowerPoint. Well, let's not fall asleep soon. Enrico, you've been quiet for a while. Um, oh, no, 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 I just noticed. I was like, oh, oh, hey. oh. Um, You were supposed to butt in in case yeah, you were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I had a mind to interrupt Olivia many, many times. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, let me talk about... Um, yeah, misogyny and, and dress wearing and concerts, honey. That's not anyway. Um, <laughs> it's not mansplaining at all. No, 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 very twenty twenty one. Yeah, look, I think it. I don't know. I think around maybe um, if we just go around and do closing thoughts or something. But um, yeah, I th like at the end of the day, it's what the the look of something is going to have an effect whether you like it or not. Um, and so there's always going to be like the. If you discount dress, you're, or if you dis if you discount everything apart from the sounds you're going to make out of your instrument, you're just kind of leaving that up to up to fate, like whatever it's going to be, and that and you will just suffer. I mean, not suffer, but you'll just have to deal with the consequences of your performance um, because they're going to be there and people are going to see them. And so I think there's just a lot of questions to be asked about. I mean, because uh, people sort of go down this route that maybe we've taken, where um. If you go further, you can say, oh, well, should everyone just wear a shirt and jeans to their class? And so I think every, and then everyone imagines the SSO in the concert hall in shirts and jeans. And there's something absurd about that. And so, yeah, no, that's not right. But I think it also, yeah, because that would look weird in that venue. Um, what does that say about the typical classical concert venue then? How can we expand sort of where these things take place? We were talking about um, the accessibility and, and um, the restrictedness of concerts where you have to go into major halls in the major city if you could if you had a kind of um i don't know an underground or at least more of a scene where you could walk into a venue like a jazz bar-esque sort of thing and people will just play or you know ensembles especially you know the the chamber ensemble thing of having a lot more of an intimate venue where then a certain type of dress and then a certain type of custom will it will just have a whole different effect on how that concert is received which i think is just good it's only a good thing where people can appreciate as many kinds of music as possible in as many ways as possible and don't have those barriers to entry and i on that i think as well that raises another issue which has been burning in the back of my head which is the idea of our duty to the music as well as our duty to our listeners. So obviously we want to show our listeners a good time. We want to make our listeners, not only listeners, responders, audience members, feel included in the event and connect to it in all sorts of ways. But also in the process, the last thing we want to be doing is not doing what we believe is the right thing by the music it is our privilege to play because it is a privilege it is a privilege to have the natural gifts and the developed talents to be able to play great classical music and i think that's that's what this all comes down to and i think it's a very delicate balancing act in all sorts of ways i mean you mentioned the idea of the sso all coming in in t-shirts and jeans would they play Beethoven 9 in the same way if they were wearing T-shirts and jeans? I don't think they would. It's exactly what your your interviewees said. They they need that. And, yeah, I think that, for me at least, should be the guiding principle of, of how we all think of of these performances and of these events. We want to make this accessible to people. We want to connect with people. We don't want to forget that music is a communicative, communicative transaction. But we also don't want to put graffiti on Beethoven in the meantime. Um, yeah, well, it's very interesting how you just said, would they play Beethoven the same way if they were in jeans and, and a shirt? Well, you know, we rehearse in jeans and a polo shirt. But do we rehearse as well as we perform? No. I don't think we do. No. And they're, 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 yeah, exactly, right? Because like, like, like I said before, you're putting on this, like you, you said, put armor. on a persona a sort persona, of thing. Yeah. yeah. I think, I think the, <laughs> the, the suits and that formal dress is 
playing into a bigger persona that mm. yeah that's that that kind of music as a whole sort of has mm. at the moment which is like i think and people talk about like people use distracting a lot when talking about the clothes oh you jazz that's distracting from right. from the music but it's that like what would be but even if it was just the shirts and jeans it was i agree that would be distracting but i don't think it's the casual dress by itself that is distracting it's a th- like that would be a discord between you know where they're playing what they're playing what we understand to be that kind of performance and what so if you do i don't know like gestures like that which like something like that i think would be fairly inconsidered and not very effective um whereas if you're like i agree it's whatever you're doing is serving if not and you know serving the music certainly to an extent but also working with the music to serve an experience that is true to the intention of of that music and i think if you're doing that everything can be harmonious without necessarily having to only take place in a big concert hall where only v- uh, formal dress formal dress makes sense mm. cool and i think that's a good any other closing thoughts before thanks for listening thanks for listening thanks for listening yeah. and watching and watching and watching. And, watching. and watching very relevant to this podcast <laughs> mm-hmm. all right thank you guys for that really uh interesting conversation i feel like we can go for like four hours on this but i don't think only we... four hours oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I, had, I had eight plans oh okay well okay <laughs> <laughs> um well unfortunately the battery would die actually it's gonna die in three minutes um so thank you guys so much for that that was actually really lovely really interesting to hear your perspectives and that we all pretty much had the same views and mm. yeah. brought different things yeah, to the table yeah, yeah. um and yeah thank you Excellent. thank you thank you thanks a lot bye